Okay. Uh, let me spit out a few scripture references for somebody <laughs> to grab and be ready to read. Uh, somebody do Isaiah chapter 10, verse 12 through 14. We're going to reach back for just a couple verses for context. But who wants that one? I'll do it. Okay. Next one is Isaiah chapter 10, also verses 24 through 25. I'll do it. I just got to find it. Okay. That's Isaiah 10, 24, 25. Uh, and then next person will be Isaiah 36, 1 through 2. I'll do that. Okay. Isaiah 37, 1 through 7. That'll be a little bit longer. So somebody yeah. can do it about reading. Marcia, you said you got that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Isaiah 37, 10 and 11. I've got it. Okay, and then one more for now. Isaiah 37, 16 through 20. I can do it. You got it? I okay. Can. Was that Don? Yeah, that's Don. Yeah. Okay. It's me. Big D. I got my notes out covering the picture, so I, I can't see your lips moving to know who's talking. <laughs> uh, okay. My first two readers, go ahead and start out. We're reaching back to set a little bit of context because one of the things that Isaiah prophesied to the people of Israel and to King Ahaz earlier on is now about to uh, play out here a few years later. So I want to look back at a couple of those prophecies and have those in the, the front of our minds once we get to where the story is. So Isaiah 10, verses 12 through 14. Whoever had okay. that, go ahead. It was me. All right. When the Lord has finished all his work against Mount Zion and Jerusalem, he will say, I will punish the king of Assyria for the willful pride of his heart and the haughty look in his eyes. For he says, by the strength of my hand, I have done this. And by my wisdom, because I have understanding, I removed the boundaries of nations. I plundered their treasures. Like a mighty one, I subdued their kings. As one reaches into a nest, so my hand reached for the wealth of the nations as men gather abandoned eggs. So I gathered all of the countries, not one flapped a wing or opened its mouth to chirp. Okay, so there's the king of Assyria. He's doing what God was telling them to do, but he's getting pretty high on himself for it. Uh, so Isaiah chapter 10, verses 24, 25. Go ahead with that. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of hosts, O my people who dwell in Zion, do not be afraid of the Syrian. He shall strike you with a rod and lift his, up his staff against you in the manner of Egypt. For yet a very little while in the dig, indignation will cease as my anger in their destruction. Okay. So Assyria is going to come in. The king is... Uh, going to be pretty proud of the work that God really only let him do, but he's thinking this is him. Uh, he's going to see a little bit of success. He said he will strike you the way Egypt did. So he's going to have some success. Israel, or Judah rather, the southern kingdom, is where this is focused. Uh, they're going to get hit, but it's going to be temporary, and then God's going to deal with Assyria. So Isaiah had prophesied that to King Ahaz. And if you remember, at the very, very beginning of the book of Isaiah, he says there are four different kings during whose reigns Isaiah gave prophecies. So during the third king, Ahaz, he gave that prophecy. Now we're going to jump forward to the fourth king. So there's a new king in Jerusalem over the southern king of Judah. His name is Hezekiah. And that's where we're going to see some of that prophecy play out as the king of Assyria starts heading in to, to do what God had said he was going to do. So who's got Isaiah 36, 1 through 2? Me? Well, I'll go ahead. Okay. In the 14th year of King Hezekiah's reign, 
Sennacherib, king of Assyria, attacked all the fortified cities of Judah and captured them. Then the king of Assyria sent his field commander with a large army from Lachish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem. When the commander stopped at the aqueduct of the upper pool on the road to Washerman's Field, Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, the palace administrator, Shebna, the secretary, and Joah, son of Asaph, the recorder, went out to him. How long was I supposed to read? Uh, the first two verses. Oh, I went past that. But that's fine. That just adds a little context. We uh, have our. Are we turned off? Are you? I just heard you. We heard oh, you. Oh, okay. Am okay. I turned off? No, no, I heard you too. Okay. Uh, so the Assyrian king sends an emissary to Judah, to Jerusalem, King Hezekiah. <laughs> to tell him that he might as well surrender now because Assyria has already overrun all of the surrounding nations. They've destroyed all these other nations' gods. So who does Judah think they are that they'll be able to stand against Assyria? Uh, so if they give up now, they won't have to starve in a siege. They can just surrender, live under Assyrian authority. So the messenger sends this message in Hebrew so that everybody sitting out on the city walls can hear it. And uh, Hezekiah actually tells them, hey, we can understand your language, so you talk, so they don't have to hear you. But part of the point of all this boasting was so that everybody would hear and be ashamed, and maybe they'd peer pressure the king into giving in. Uh, but they didn't respond. They held their peace. Uh, but even in that, they were pretty shook up by this show of force. At one point, this Assyrian commander even offers to spot them 2,000 horses uh, if Judah thinks they could have enough riders to put on their backs. He's like, you know, we'll, we'll even give you the horses to come fight us. That's how sure we are beating you. Uh, and that really kind of brings uh, an interesting thought to, to uh, the forefront here. So I want to ask you, when you feel surrounded or you feel attacked by a threat that is so far beyond what you can handle, a situation <laughs> that's way out of your control, What's your first instinct? How, how, how do you respond when something comes up that's that big? Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Yeah, sometimes it kind of forces the simple prayers out of you, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. I usually do a prayer. Can you hear me? Yeah. You usually do a prayer, and then you do kind of like a T chart. What is the positive what are the pros and cons to this situation yeah you know what could i do that would be successful what i do that i think would be that will fail and then look at all the resources what resources do i have in this type of situation is there anyone else who i could call is there any allies is there somebody else that has beef with the same enemy that i have so i can try and bring them into the fold so that's kind of how i would look at the situation yeah Listen to the Holy Spirit. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Look at Jack being all spiritual. <laughs> and boy. Tattoo. <laughs> I cry a lot. <laughs> just admit it. <laughs> I, I appreciate you realizing. I was just thinking, uh, you know, I I would probably have a hesitation, you know, take a minute and and sometimes those situations just kind of shock you into inaction for a moment is, is mm-hmm. you're a little overwhelmed and, and, and what do I do? You don't necessarily know where to go first. And sometimes you don't even think to pray as your first reflex because you're just so overwhelmed. Uh, let's look at what Hezekiah's first reaction is to this. And, and it opens chapter 37. Uh, so who's got that, that little bit longer passage of Isaiah 37, verses 1 through 7? That was Marcia. That was supposed to be me. All right, well, go ahead. When King Hezekiah heard this, <clears throat> he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and went into the temple of the Lord. He sent Eliakim, the palace administrator, Shebna, the secretary, and the leading priests, all wearing sackcloth to the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos. They told him, 
This is what Hezekiah says. This day is a day of distress and rebuke and disgrace as when children come to the point of birth and there is no strength to deliver them. It may be that the Lord your God will hear the words of the field commander whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to ridicule the living God and that he will rebuke him for the words the Lord your God has heard. Therefore pray for the remnant that still survives. When King Hezekiah's officials came to Isaiah, Isaiah said to them, Tell your master, this is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid of what you have heard. Those words with which the underlings of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Listen, I am going to put a spirit in them so that when he hears a certain report, he will return to his own country, and there I will have him cut down with the sword. How far do I go? That was it. Okay. Uh, so break that down for me a little bit. What is Hezekiah's response? How, how, does, how does he respond, react to this message that was brought to him? He's distressed. He's tore his clothes. There's some distress that there. Clock. It's very real. What does he do next? He sends for help. Sends for he help. Sends his, sends his people to uh, Isaiah, the prophet. <laughs> what does he do in between the two? He's distressed. He tears his clothes. And then what does he do? Right up there, verse, he, verse one. He goes into the temple of the Lord. He oh. goes to the temple. <laughs> that too. <laughs> So yeah, he's being a little bit like Carlton and Jack there. Uh, you you mm -hmm. hear the, the gravity of the word spoken against you, and then he goes and gets spiritual. <laughs> uh, it takes a second for it to sink in. He's not taking it lightly, but he knows where to run because he has nowhere else to run. Uh, so he goes to church, basically. He goes to God's house. Uh, so finally... We're getting a king that wants to handle things the right way, which is kind of refreshing after the first little bit uh, we've seen in the book of Isaiah with previous kings. Uh, and sure enough, excuse me, in the verses following, uh, we see that the Assyrian king's emissary gets news of a war going on uh, back elsewhere in the empire, and he's recalled to go help in that battle. So sounds just in line with what God had said. He's going to hear word, and there's going to be a spirit in him to, to run and go back home. But on the way out, the emissary sends a final note back to King Hezekiah. Somebody read Isaiah 37, 10 through 11. Who had that? I did. Okay, go ahead, Beth. This message is for King Hezekiah of Judah. Don't let your God, in whom you trust, deceive you with promises that Jerusalem will not be captured by the king of Assyria. You know perfectly well what the kings of Assyria have done wherever they have gone. They have completely destroyed everyone who stood in their way. Why should you be any different? Does that sound like the devil at all to you? He, he finds out that God had sent a word, and now he's immediately trying to say, yeah, I am going, but... Don't you be putting trust in God. Don't you be hoping in God. Don't you just ignore that word because I'm going to come back and finish this thing off. Uh, that's something we see the devil doing all through scripture, isn't it? Trying to get us to doubt a word that God's given. Uh, has that ever happened with you? You want to share a time maybe where, where you didn't see something come through as quickly as maybe you thought and, and there was that temptation to doubt a word that God had spoken in your life? We're going to leave a pause there for a second. But you don't have to if you don't want to. Or maybe it doesn't readily formulate itself into a three-sentence paragraph. <laughs> now you can smell it. My toe. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. I think we can readily okay. identify with what Hezekiah is probably feeling at this point. When that message comes back, 
Yeah, God may have said that, but don't get your hopes up too high. Uh, but Hezekiah is committed to trusting God, so he goes right back to the temple later on in chapter 37. Uh, he gets that news, and he takes it right back to God and said, Okay, God, you told me this was going to happen, and yeah, the general's leaving, but then I get this note back. Now what do I do with this? Uh, and just because he gets another threat doesn't make him doubt God's word. He takes that threat right back and lays it before God. It says he spreads the letter out on the altar before God, and then he prays this prayer in verse 16. Who had Isaiah 37, 16? Was that Don? Yep, that's me. Yes. Oh, Lord of heaven's armies, God of Israel, you are enthroned between the mighty cherubim. You alone are God of all the kingdoms of the earth. You alone created the heavens and the earth. Bend down, O Lord, and listen. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Listen to Sher Sher uh, Sennacherib, words of defiance against the living God. It is true, Lord, that the kings of Assyria have destroyed all these nations, and they have thrown the gods of these nations, nations into the fire and burned them. But of course the Assyrians could destroy them. They were not gods at all, only idols of wood and stone shaped by human hands. Now, O Lord our God, rescue us from his power, then all of the kingdoms of the earth will know that you alone, O Lord, are God. Amen. Amen. <laughs> how, does, how does Hezekiah start that prayer? What kinds of things is he saying at the beginning there in verse 16? He's praising the Lord. <clears throat> yeah. He's well, praising God. He's he's yeah, declaring yeah. God's greatness. Yeah, de declaring his power. He's declaring his uh, sovereignty, his power, and his authority. Yeah. Uh, did God need reminded of how great God is? No, but he did. He loves to hear it. Hezekiah did. Uh, <laughs> and I, what, what, what can we take away from this to build into our own prayers when we're feeling pressed? Start with praise. Start with praise. <laughs> yeah, start with some praise. When you are feeling the most discouraged, the most surrounded, the best thing you can do is start your prayer time by reminding yourself of how great God is and make that bigger in your vision. And then the rest of your prayer time is going to go a little more clearly and you're going to be more ready to hear from God uh, on, when, on the other end when he starts talking back to you. <clears throat> All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a, a second right here and throw a couple more verses out. We'll throw a couple other out there uh, so you're ready with them. Uh, Isaiah 37, 33 through 35. I'll grab that. Okay, Carlton's got that. Isaiah 37, 36 through 38. I can do that. Okay. Uh, and then I think I might... Uh, no, I won't stop there. Uh, Isaiah 39, or no, Isaiah 38, 1 through 8. Actually, I can do that. Down in my notes. Who, who said that? Yeah. Okay, can you uh, and then 39, 4 through 8. I'll do that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> oh, I missed something. And this is big, too. Uh, as we're looking at that prayer, at the kind of in the middle of Isaiah 37, he starts with praise. And it really looks like Hezekiah is more concerned with God defending his honor and showing his glory than he is with dealing with his own problems. It's kind of like he knows that when God shows up to defend his own glory, God's people are taken care of by default. And uh, I really appreciate Hezekiah's perspective in that, in that he had plenty of things to pray about, plenty of needs to bring before God's throne. But in his prayer... He's making it more about God's glory, knowing that that's the more important issue than his need. And I think that's also, if you're, if you're taking any kind of notes, put that down for your prayer life as well. Declare God's greatness so that you understand how big he is. And then remind yourself 
my life is more about God and his purpose and his glory than about my needs. And when you tell yourself to pray that direction, you're going to see a lot more fruit out of your prayer life. Uh, so God responds to that prayer by sending a message through Isaiah. This time Hezekiah doesn't go ask Isaiah what's going on. God sends a message through Isaiah. Uh, and it says, because you came to me to, about this issue, because you came to pray about it instead of worry about it and figure it out yourself, God says, I'm going to take care of it. Uh, so somebody read that Isaiah 37, 33 through 35. I forget who grabbed that. Carlton, did you have it, I think? <laughs> this is part of God's response. Therefore, this is what the Lord says concerning the king of Assyria. He will not enter this city or shoot an arrow here. He will not come before it with shield or build a siege ramp against it. By the way that he came, he will return. He will not enter this city, declares the Lord. I will defend this city and save it for my sake and for the sake of David, my servant. Amen. Amen. That word starts with a few verses back, God saying, because you came and prayed to me, I'm going to make sure he doesn't set foot in this city. Uh, and that's a real strong encouragement. When you feel surrounded, you feel pressed, take it to God first. Don't wait till you've tried everything else. Start with prayer. And then you're getting God to partner with you in the situation, and he can lead you in how things need to go according to God's plan. Uh, so who had verses 36 through 38? Let's read the epilogue to this story here. Then the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, broke camp and withdrew. He returned to Nineveh and stayed there. One day while he was worshiping in the temple of his god Nisroch, his sons Ad. Drimelech and Sherezer killed him with a sword, and they escaped to the land of Ararat. And Esser Herdron, his son, succeeded him as king. Uh, some of those names are names that you read about in history, but <laughs> not in the Bible. Uh, and it takes greater scholars than I to correct any pronunciation. <laughs> uh, so uh, don't feel bad about that. Um, but here we see that story played out. God said, I'm going to put a spirit in him that he hears something going to call him away and he's not going to be back. Now, he puffed up a little bit and, and that general was starting to yell and, and scream and say, no, God's not going to save you. I'm coming back. But when it was all said and done, God's word held true and stood firm and Assyria stopped being a problem uh, and a threat to the kingdom of Judah. And uh, that's just, it's great encouragement to me um let's move on uh, uh heading into the next chapter sometime after this hezekiah becomes very very ill uh, it actually says deathly ill uh and i want to go ahead and read through this story because isaiah puts it better than i could summarize <laughs> and uh then we'll then we'll talk about a couple things in there so uh whoever had isaiah chapter 38 verses 1 through 8 go ahead and read through that for us in those days, Hezekiah was sick and near death, and Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amoz, went to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Then Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord and said, Remember now, O Lord, I pray, how I have walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. And the word of the Lord came to Isaiah, saying, Go and tell Hezekiah, Thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father, I have heard your prayer, I have seen your tears. Surely I will add days, add to your days fifteen years. I will deliver you in this city from the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city. And this is the sign to you from the Lord, that the Lord will do this thing which he has spoken. Behold, I will bring the shadow of thou, which has gone down with the sun of the sundown, 
of Ahaz 10 degrees backward. So the sun returned 10 degrees on the dial by which it had gone down. Wow. That's a pretty neat little story buried here in one of the, the prophetic books. Um, and before I ask about this, just as an aside, that story about uh, the, the angel of the Lord heading out into the Assyrian camp and killing off a couple hundred thousand soldiers, I think that's in the book of Second Kings, tells that in a little more detail. So if you want to see a little more of what was happening in story form around this part of Isaiah, you can go look through Second Kings and find that story. It's, it's a neat story. Uh, but this one's got a lot of interesting points in it, just these eight verses. So let me ask, what stands out the most to you in this story? That the Lord heard Hezekiah's prayer and he answered him. Mm -hmm. yeah. Rick, you're muted. The contrast between the gloating of the Assyrians that, you know, we've conquered all these places and their gods haven't been able to do anything. Sounds a little bit like some of the politicking that's going on right now. And, and we have to be very careful that we don't gloat, that we don't assume that, uh, yes, we believe our God is greater, but we don't gloat about it. We don't boast and uh and yet god and i'm i'm watching this series the 10 commandments and it's coming out very clearly there where uh pharaoh uh, believed that he had control over everything and finally when his son dies he realized he has no control at all that this god of the hebrews can do everything, and his gods. <laughs> Amen. I'll, I'll say something that sticks out to me, and happened in both uh, chapter thirty-seven and thirty-eight, is how God shifted based upon Hezekiah's prayer. Yeah. What if Hezekiah never prayed? What if he never asked? Hey, um, I've done all all that you wanted me to do. I don't want to die. And then God added 15 years. What if he just complained and didn't pray to God? Then he right. would die. But God reacts. So what the story kind of shows is how God reacts to our prayer. So it doesn't, sh and it also shows, it goes against everybody says that, hey, we're predestined and what what's going to happen is already going to happen. Well, a lot of it goes by what we do. God wouldn't tell us to pray fervently if it didn't make a difference. Right. No, so that's kind of what it's here, you know. the word from God was you're gonna die. Go get your lawyer hey, and get your papers. Get right? You know, I mean, how many Did of us would have heard that prophetic word from a respected prophet that had prophesied to three kings before me? And we hear that word and say, Well, okay, then I guess if that's what God said, it's done. But Hezekiah said, No, I, I think I'm gonna go check in just to make sure. <laughs> yeah. You had everything to gain and nothing to lose, right? Yes. I'm I'm already dying. What's it gonna hurt if I pray a little bit about it? And uh and God says okay. And and he, he mirrors it uh, or accompanies it with this sign uh that is is so only God would do things like change the timeline. You know, that's a science fiction thing. Uh, to make a sundial turn back 10 degrees. Uh, and and God volunteered that, kind of like God volunteered the sign earlier in the book of Isaiah. God said, just just to show you how cool I am, I'm going to do something really awesome to prove <laughs> Anything else in that story uh, jump out at anybody? Well, there's, there's prophecy of doom and it can be averted. Yeah. Yeah. By prayer. By prayer. And, and just because there are prophetic words 
does not mean it's final because prophecy happens when it occurs and it can happen multiple spots yeah into the future and and so we have to be very careful we, we can lie, oh you know there's doom and gloom and there's gonna but we can pray get on our knees and we can actually help change it amen yeah, I, mean, I mean we say we you know even the bible says we only prophesy in part so when prophecies come you only get a portion of what god's plan is or for what he wants to deliver to you at that point in time and also one of the things that also sticks out with that is that through prophecy there's always requirements there's always things that the actions and things that you have to follow through and be obedient for the prophecies to come to pass. That's where a lot of people miss it. It's like, oh, well, the prophecies didn't happen. My first question is, what didn't you follow through with what God asked you to do? That's my first question. Yeah. What did God ask you to do that you didn't do? And then that would tell you why the prophecy didn't happen. Because you didn't fulfill your requirement, because so God can fulfill His. That kind of falls in line with that. So, so Isaiah gave him a partial prophecy, and then Hezekiah prayed about it and says, "Hey God, there's more here for me. I know that, that you can you can save me. I know you can add lives. I know I've done everything I I have for you. I still don't feel like my job here is still not done fully." So then God says, I agree, and gives him more life. Yeah. So it's interesting about these prophecies. It is. Uh, for the sake of time, because I want to get a good look at chapter 40 before we leave, I'm going to gloss over uh, chapter 39 after Hezekiah recovers. And uh, uh, it's a really interesting chapter, really interesting story where the king of Babylon sends some people to say, hey, we heard about you getting sick. Glad you're feeling better. <laughs> send some gifts. And at this point, Hezekiah is feeling pretty comfortable about his life, feeling pretty secure. Assyria is not a threat. He's got his health back. And it sounds like pride begins to, to come in a little bit, maybe some gloating like Rick was talking about. Uh, and Hezekiah kind of gets nailed for it. And it's a little bit of a, a bittersweet twist to that narrative. And I encourage you to read through it some because it's an interesting story. But we're actually going to kind of gloss over 39 here and move to chapter 40 where Isaiah moves into a section that uh, is, is more in the nature of, a, of prophetic words. Uh, you could kind of call them oracles like we had earlier in the book or just words from God. And I want to take a look at this first chapter of this section tonight. Some really well-known passages that I'm sure a lot of us have heard before. Uh, and let's start that. Somebody, uh, I'll go ahead and look at about three to be read. Uh, we'll take about 10 minutes and go through these. Uh, so chapter 40, 1 through 5, who wants to read that? Take that. Okay. Uh, chapter 40, verse 21 through 26. I'll take okay. it. Who's got that? Right. Carlton? No, okay. sure. And then 40, 27 through 31 to finish out the chapter. Who's got that? I'll take that. Okay, Kimberly? Okay, uh, so go ahead with that first one through five. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Tell her that her sad days are gone and her sins are pardoned. Yes, the Lord has punished her twice over for all her sins. Listen, it is the voice of someone shouting, clear the way through the wilderness for the Lord. Make straight highway through the wasteland for our God. Fill in the valleys and level the mountains and hills. Straighten the curves and smooth out the rough places. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together. The Lord has spoken. Who knows what the middle of that prophecy is referring to? Does anybody recognize that from somewhere else in Scripture? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. Uh, the book of Mark opens with this passage, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. So this is a prophecy about Jesus coming, essentially, 
on making the glory of the Lord visible. Uh, and I, I just love finding these back in the books of the prophets, the ones that you hear referenced in the New Testament. Um, let's go ahead to the next passage, Isaiah 40, 21 through 26. Okay. It's also sung in the song of the Messiah. <laughs> yeah, the song of the Messiah. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground, then he blows them, blows on them, and they wither. And a whirlwind sweeps them away like a shaft. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal? Says the Holy One. <clears throat> Amen. No. What comes to mind for you when you read these kinds of descriptions of God and his work? What, what does that do in you? Makes me feel really tiny. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Start talking like Mickey Mouse a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but then it kind of encourages you because it says, because you think that's, one, that's my resource. Yeah. That's right. I have connection. I am an heir to that throne. Yeah. That's right. So it kind of pumps you up. So you feel little, but it's like, I, I kind of see myself as a little child. I remember when I was a little child, I looked at my dad. He was six, four and a half. He was like a giant. He could yeah. do no wrong. I mean, you know, he could beat anybody up and do anything. I always picture myself like that when I'm referencing God. Well, yeah. when I when I look up and, and see the heavens and the stars, it, it it makes me feel really, really tiny. But then I remember that we are God's workmanship. And in workmanship, he takes pride in, in what he has created. And I'm one of those creations. So I can feel that, but I can also feel big because of his love and his workmanship. That's beautiful. Well spoken. Uh -oh. I think that's a really good lead into this last section that uh, might be the most well known of this chapter. Uh, Kimberly, you want to finish that out for us? 27 to 31. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles, they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. That one. Yeah, that's good stuff. What is the message you hear for us in this passage? To hope in the Lord. <clears throat> Looking to him for our source and help in times of need. He's my strength. Yeah. He is our confidence and our strength. Yes. Hang in there. Hang in there. Never leave us. Yeah. Right. That's your refuge. He's my refuge. Yeah. It kind of summarizes it. Yeah. Uh, I I learned a song when I was five or six years old of the last two verses there. Uh, and they've been my favorites for a long, long time, or some of my favorites. The thing that stuck out most to today when I was going over this again was the first part of that. And the message that, yeah, 
compared to how great God is, we are really tiny. But don't ever, ever think that God has somehow overlooked your life or ignored your problems. If you continue to trust in him, he will carry you. He sees you. He's not ignoring you. He knows exactly where you are, and he's not abandoned you. Uh, and if that was true for Old Testament Israel, that is so much more true now that every believer has the Holy Spirit living inside of us. Uh, and to me, that's just overwhelming encouragement. Amen. Amen. Sure.